Um, okay, great. Uh, so welcome everyone. So glad to see your faces and, and names. Um, I think most of you know me, um, but my name is Katie Shetlick. Um, and I have the honor and the privilege of serving on the board at the Bridge Progressive Arts Initiative. Um, Alan, our director, is down there in the other Brady Bunch grid. It's there for me, but maybe perhaps not for you. Um, welcome, Alan. Thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, just want to thank Alan for um, making this happen. Um, for inviting dance and particularly Zapp's film into the windows the whole month of the bridge during November. Um, it's just been, oh, here come some people. Um, it's just been really nice to, yeah, having moving, ha to see moving bodies um, on that, on those screens there. Um, so thanks so much for that. Um, so tonight we'll be, um, having just like a really informal conversation with Zach McConnell, who is the director of um, the film that you were just watching, um, The Owl of Minerva, Minerva Arrives Only at Dusk. Um, and so I'm gonna just ask Zap a few questions to get us started. Um, and then we can turn this into more of a conversation and some people are jumping in here and I'm gonna add them. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just keeping yourself muted during the first part, and then we'll sort of do a pass the mic, um, as we move into the evening, um, because, um, so much of Zapp's, uh, work and particularly this work is about place. I just want to, um, recognize the fact that I'm on the traditional land of the Monacan people. Um, also known as Charlottesville. Um, and I just wanna invite everyone to send in their location in the chat so we can know where everyone is. Um, sometimes the space of Zoom can kind of take us out of, or works to take us out of our bodies and out of spaces um, that are really particular to the kind of conversations I imagine us having this evening. Um, so if you wouldn't mind sending those places into the chat and we can just see where everyone's at tonight. Um, for those of you that arrived a little bit later, just to let you know, we are recording this conversation. Um, so if you need to turn off your video, feel free. Um, what else? Any other Zoom 101s? I think that's the gist of it. Um, so we got a lot of folks from Charlottesville here, um, which was bound to happen. And some folks I know not from Charlottesville. It's great to see uh, Elizabeth Zimmer here. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, so I'll, I'll, I think a lot of you know Zap um, and know of Zap's work. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of introduce Zap from a more um, personal place. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Zap finally in person um, at Hollands University, um, where we were both uh, students at the time, but I had, Zap was sort of already a legend in my mind. I had, uh, when I moved to Charlottesville, um, as soon as I told anyone that I was involved with uh, movement or dance, everyone was like, oh, do you know Zap? You have to meet Zap. Um, and so meeting uh, Zap in real life, uh, she, lived up to the legend of, of what everyone spoke, of all kind words, everyone spoke about her and her work. Um, so it's really a privilege to just be here with her and talking about her work. Um, and so that's kind of, a, that's where I kind of want to start is maybe at that more, more personal level. Um, the content of the film, hopefully you all have seen parts of it um, or maybe the whole thing and hopefully on the windows at the bridge, because it looked really amazing in those three screens. Um, but you know, the work moves through all of these very like massive systems of oppression um, and does this job of sort of pointing out the fact that they are intertwined. Um, and because you know that material is there and heavy, um, and because I also heard Zap, overheard Zap sharing um, a story about one of the scenes. Um, that was really specific to, I think, a childhood story of hers. 
Um, I would love, Zab, if you wouldn't mind just sharing some of the ways in which your biography finds its way into the content of this work. Okay. Um, first of all, what, what a pleasure to be here and um, to be sponsored by the Bridge Progressive Arts Initiative. Um, I'm a huge fan from the very beginning. Uh, and, um, and then for you, Katie, to be mediating this or moderating it or whatever, however, holding it, holding in the space um, makes me feel really happy. Um, there's some cool feedback loop that's happening. And now it's gone. Um, anyway, Katie is a rock star in her own right. Um, when it when it comes to uh, the work, yes, there's seven chapters, and um, a lot of them are more literal than usually I like to to work. But over the years, I've gotten a little bit more on the nose with some of my um, statements and um, visions. But I was. Uh, drawn to making a chapter that was purely biologically specific to me, kind of um, like a secret score that probably no one would get. And so that was the, the scene called Loss of Innocence where you have fairies. And um, so I, I created that those ideas and visions. They they kind of came to me organically. I drew a lot of pictures. That's part of my process. Um, and I envisioned um, just this kind of magical setting where you weren't quite didn't really understand what was happening um, with this through line of a changeling. And that's because as a child, I thought I was a changeling. I'm adopted. And I was convinced that uh, uh, fairies broke into my parents' house and stole a human child and left me a fairy child. That's what a, a changeling is. And the and I had proof because every time I kind of went myself, um, and I thought, that's, you know, that's my fairy power. I don't know. Uh, some, like the woods would communicate with me. The trees would communicate with me. And I was very small. So then it was an Easter. Um, and my parents were at a Presbyterian church. And we had to get dressed up for Easter. And it was just this horrible polyester 1970s um, pleated yellow skirt with top and it's the sun is beating down and I had to stand on the island right in front of the church to wait for them to pull the car around to grab me and I hated it I didn't really particularly like certain aspects of church um and as I was standing there I said well at least you know I'm going to get back to the trees in our backyard and I'm a fairy so I can handle this and, and then I looked up to see my little sparkles, just to feel reassured by my fairiness. And then I saw them move because the sun was bright and my eyelids were opening and closing and my logical, rational mind got born that day. And I realized suddenly that I was not a fairy. Those weren't magical sparkles. They were my eyelashes and I just like was devastated. My parents had no idea. I've just, all concepts of magic and fairiness were just dashed in that one blink. And I got home and ran upstairs and just cut my eyelashes off. So <laughs> that made it into the story I think it's appropriate, but I just wanted one section in the film to have a little bit of a personal touch where it wasn't explained. And hopefully people got whatever they got from it, but 
I think that's what you're speaking to, Katie. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think too. I'm also that was a story I overheard um, that night. But I think um, I'm also interested in um, the ways you move through some of these larger systems through your own biography um, and how you move through the world and identify, and then how that might grant you access to um, taking some of these materials on or ask inviting others to move through them um so yeah well one thing I started doing is um I love to do research I know that sounds kind of nerdy especially based in place and um what I was also looking at I was reading this incredible book by uh Dr. Joy DeGruy called uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome and looking at intergenerational trauma and then just thinking about um, how that continues to the world um, through the people who are oppressed and the people who are oppressing. And so I started thinking about my own heritage, um, which is complicated because I'm adopted, but I, I have the lucky situation where I know my biological family as well. And actually my real family has more information, like both sides of my family have done lots of research of where our ancestors came from. My biological family, my sisters are kind of catching up. Um, that family system was not always so interested. But it just so happened that my sister from my biological family discovered um, that certain parts of our family, I can't remember if it's on the mom's side or the dad's side, own slaves. And then the other side of the family um, were partial Native Americans. And then my real family, there's slave owners and there's some African descent uh, mixed in. So I'm a strange kind of conglomerate mutt, but I have oppressors and the oppressed mixed in to my um, my ancestry and kind of what I take, like I'm born into a class system that comes from privilege. And that's from so many complicated things that I think so many people are looking at right now. And, um, and then mixed into it are folks who had their land taken, their lives taken. And I just wanted to like look that in the face and I mean, I've been doing that kind of research for a really long time, ever since I think I was a teenager, especially into Native American politics. Um, but then to, to really put a fine magnifying glass on it and look into accountability, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, you know, the, the hidden wound as Wendell Berry speaks of it of the United States where we don't speak of these things or you don't admit it. Um, I, ha I have like a complicated relationship of acknowledging things that come to me that wouldn't come to somebody who wasn't white or didn't get grow up in a middle-class society that like I did. Um, but I also don't wanna take on my father's burdens. So I look at all of that together. Um, so we can move forward and understand equity in this country now. And, and then, you know, you see all these things erupting in the United States, and then especially in Charlottesville years back. Um, so the, the research and the personal kind of contemplation and taking action and getting past like that awkward shame and, um, seeing like, well, what can I do? And part of it is just keep digging, keep acknowledging and taking actions forward. So a lot of what the film is about is looking at that, like legacy, that whole, I mean, the cloak of uh, whiteness, of course, but legacy is again, a more indirect exploration. Cause I also asked all of the dancers to go inside what is their family legacy and where are the traumas? Where are the gifts? Um, what does that mean to you? I didn't 
tell people what that should mean for them. So every some people did family trees, some people did a feeling, some people did an actual tree that their family planted, some people um, really exercised some demons, some people thought of beautiful aspects that they cherish. Um, and that is what our country is made of, of people and communities and families in the end of the day. Um, and how can we work towards being in right relationship with each other and the earth, you know? Did that? Yeah, yeah. Zab, you actually sort of bled into something else <laughs> that I was um, um, curious about having been involved in the process, which you were just sort of talking about the way that you invited us in and there's other folks here that were part of the process um, to move through uh, many of these questions um, and processes. And of course we know that process and content are never, really, never mutually exclusive. Um, and you know, often, um, yeah, the process as performance, but I think there was something even more um, pointed about the way that um, the sort of process of making the video, this is just my experience, I can only speak from my experience, um, seemed to be, right, the means versus the end, like in order to move through these things, right, um, we have to know that they're going to be documented, that they we're going to share space together, that someone else is going to witness it. And one way to create that container, right, is through a project of making a film. Um, and so in, I'm thinking in particular about uh, the stick cut of girl problems. Am I, is that the right, am I remembering the title correctly? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and just the, that process, um, and maybe if you wanna explain the process for a few folks that um, weren't a part of it, um, but that, you know, the strange thing of like knowing your video being video during this process of um, a moment of going internal and thinking about um, what that title might mean to you and what that space might conjure up, um, but not feeling um, like a victim. And so like the creation of that space uh, felt really powerful for me as a person, right? Um, so I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more, you did already about the making of the film as a process of healing itself or a process of unraveling legacy. Um, and then, yeah, and then the choice, and then that related to like how the edits came, because I'm sure you had a lot, a lot of material. And then how your experience of being in the process with us maybe informed some of the edit choices, the editing choices that were made. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'll start specific with the stick cut of girl problems and then try to broaden out and then if I lose my way you'll intersect me and say no how about this is what I was asking um when it when it came to the stick head of girl problems um that is the one part of the of the film where uh no, nothing is scripted uh me and Liz Simmons who uh were part of what Crystal Claw, that's our, the name of our group, and we make installations. We spent a lot of time actually building that stick hut and talking about the Me Too movement. And the idea kind of just showed up um, where I felt moved to, to create a safer space that I would personally take on the responsibility to witness people. It was completely volunteer. Every person who was part of the project, I, I said, if you identify as a girl and you identify with the Me Too movement, whatever that means to you, you're welcome to come have a um, performative, authentic, ritualistic movement practice for three minutes. It's gonna be strictly timed because if we go too far in, I don't know if I have the way to like support and hold you, um, but for three minutes, I knew I had that. And also every person who's in the project I knew. So I felt 
that I could do that safely for everyone. Um, and the rules were you could ask for something, you could ask for a treatment as in, I want cloth, I want flowers, I want to plant something, I want water. Um, and I timed it and had a bell at the beginning and the end and you didn't have to do it in the middle of it you could leave at any moment you could leave you would be recorded for three minutes exactly and then I did the editing of that and my promise to each of the performers was that I wouldn't put in their, their most vulnerable or their most emotional work so I felt protective of that um so yes, we're showing a thing and there's communication happening and it's performative, but I wanted to be protective of people's psyche and vulnerability and honor the ritual of it. So it was rough to edit that. And so many people in the project wanted to participate and um, I wanted it to be exactly three minutes. So there's only a few choice seconds of each person, but that was also something that I kind of wanted to show was, uh, oh yeah, oh, and another, per oh, here's another person. Oh, yep, another person. And, but people um, asked for what they needed and it seemed to be transformative for everyone who participated it, in it, like we were in a natural setting um, the stick hut got moved from one location to the next and it's still residing in its last location in the forest. Um, and it was, it was a lot, um, but I felt like it was important and strong. And, you know, now we're a few years away from the Me Too movement, but I just never thought anything like that would ever happen in my lifetime. And I, I just have seen the changes in our society uh, kind of rippling out or tsunamiing out, you know, and that's a whole nother conversation. But to kind of take the personal and explode it into the general practice of the film, not that we didn't have stressful moments, not that we weren't trying to get a thing done, um, but the way that I work and or strive to work, I don't always achieve it, is for people to feel included and invited in. And with this project, uh, it was really such a gift, like everyone just gifted their time, literally. And um, we could cook big meals, we'd have a potluck. Um, I did so much research and I, I would create like these links or suggestions or this 10 minute video here, why don't you read this excerpt? But no one had to do it. Like you could go as far into the research as you wanted, or if you're like, mm, I don't need to read Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility right now. No, thank you. You didn't, you know, it wasn't required. Um, I try to make sure that people are warm when they're moving, that we, that we feel safe, that there's quiet places for people to rest. Sometimes when you only have a few hours with a drone and the light is coming and you have to get the shot, there's, you know, we're not all just getting free massages and someone's feeding us grapes. Like there's some, there's discipline and hard work, but uh, why not have the process be the product as well? You know, we don't need diva moments. We don't need people to injure themselves for a performance. Um, I plan to make work my whole life. I have made a lot of work my whole life. I don't want my whole life to just be a stressful process for some tiny product at the end. So, um, so that kind of concept that came that you saw so focused in the stick hut of girl problems, um, hopefully rippled through the whole whole scenario, all all of it. Um, and there's it seems like there's some performers who are also on this chat if. You wanted to hear back from them, they might be like, it was horrible. She made me wear this costume, I hate it. <laughs> I don't think so. But um, did I did I go in and out? Did I catch all of your question? Yeah, I mean, just 
however you wanted to respond. And I think that would, you know, your call out is a great time to, um, for me to cede the floor, so to speak. Um, and what I propose we can do, um, and I'll always be here, um, is a, a sort of pass the mic. Um, so, um, you know, you could, there's a option um, to raise your hand digitally um, on Zoom, or you can do this um, and I can pass the mic to whoever has a question. Um, and then, you know, if it's more of a conversational thing, we can pass the mic um, and I'll kind of remove myself from this position. Um, but yeah, maybe Zap, since there are, I, I didn't uh, warn you <laughs> about this, but maybe since there are some, a lot of people who were a part of your process, um, and maybe if you think of it, so maybe not right now, but if you have any questions too, you're welcome to ask questions, obviously, of, of, of mm -hmm. us in the space. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, if anyone wants to, yeah, either comment or share or ask um, Zap a question about her work in process. People are shy. Yeah, it always just takes the one, you know? Um, but I mean, silence is, you know, silence is also good. I think, yeah, this material is, is, is heavy and personal and um, yeah. So I think si the space of silence is, is telling of that too. Yeah, hi, Jennifer. Hi. There's so much to say or, or ask, but I will, I will say this, what I've learned so far tonight is I did not know about the story of the cutting of the eyelashes. And I was there for that filming. That's the only part I wasn't in. So I got to watch it being shot. Actually, I was inside with the costuming. The costuming was so profound in that segment of the film. And, um, it's really cool that I got to hear about the genesis of that story. I am so grateful that I got to hear that today. Um, so yeah, Opal's down here. I can't see her face, but I'm thinking about her with the eyelashes. <laughs> oh my gosh, Zap, I love you. Okay, so <laughs> I'm sure I have lots of other stuff to say, but that's like, I'm just gonna, yeah. I felt so grateful to be a part of this process. Um, it's really interesting when we shot all this and just like you sent me that Dr. Guri, Deguri YouTube and watching her and feeling very inspired by that um research that you did and just from my own sensibilities and then all of this happening in terms of our country having a little bit more of a reckoning or something it's not even there's so much work to do but um i just think it's really cosmic that you were pushing this and and then here we are with the summer that we had with the finally people caring about the police, um, the data about the police killings of black people and, and even more um, with, with our land. I feel like even this Thanksgiving, it's seeing more people. I'm like, okay, is this just me or people? Are we, are we opening up our minds a little bit more? Do people have more free time? What is going on? Um, so um, I, I hope more people will enjoy your film. And really there are parts, it's, it's not joyful. There are parts that you feel like your gut, it feels like, whoa, but you know me, I like, I like that type of stuff. <laughs> so it's real, <laughs> thank you. 
Yeah, I'll just say too, I had that same moment, Jennifer, when I overheard Zach telling that story about the eyelashes, because I think it is such a powerful image in the in the film itself. And I think, you know, probably echoes out various things to different people, um, depending on like personal context. But yeah, that image just, it, there's something so surreal about it. And um, then to know that it was an actual event. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, the way that we could, you know, then think about even that singular event. I think that's why I was interested in this biography question, this like singular event of that moment of you cutting your eyelashes and how all of these other things in some way are like compounded and could possibly com be compounded in that moment. Like, yeah, I don't know. I just, um, so I think in some ways that, that, that um, comes through that, that one moment that it, it like, this one action can like hold so much resonance, you know? Um, but I'm glad you have your eyelashes back, Zach. Well, they never grew back quite the same. Um, but I wanted to use that, that uh, uh, chapter as an example also, if you had asked um, what kind of feedback or how I react to who is a co-creator with me. And um, while, we were shooting that scene it was super freezing and raining and um we got opal and cynthia finally out and they got that the part that you see them in and um d was fascinated with the costume and so after the whole shot i think opal had even left and the next day it was just D and some other folks. And um, he was like, why, why didn't you think of me as a fairy? I'm like, oh, I just didn't. And he's like, I wanna be a fairy. I'm like, okay, so we've already shot it, but how can we do this? So we took Opal's outfit, cut the sides out because his body is so wide and um, did some shots and then wove him in through the editing. Um, and it just gave an even more interesting layer. Um, and he's so thrilled when he opens up the, the um, curtain, you kind of see him just like, yes, I'm a fairy. <laughs> so a lot of times I'll pivot in a process um, because I'm working with co-collaborators really. And I, I'm still keeping the vision so it's not just running amok, um, but I want, I want people to feel like they can say, hey, how about this or add something or say that doesn't work or um, you know, that kind of collaboration started back in the day with Zen Monkey Project. Um, and that's what drew me to Charlottesville originally. But I will say that um, when it came to kind of adding certain things in, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who make films and they're like, well, but you can't do that. But you script it out and you make this and you're wasting time and don't improv with the camera and don't improv with the content. And that's just a certain feel people in the field might feel that way, but one thing I, I did is do, I kind of went and did some more research of filmmakers where that is the actual, what they do. They create scenarios that are structured improvs that they capture on film and then they edit it. And I think it's all available and all wonderful, but um, that was just a little moment I wanted to touch on anyway. I, oh, sorry. Catherine's raising her hand. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Catherine, and then we'll bounce it to him. My, my timer's going off because I'm <laughs> supposed to drain my pasta. <laughs> it happened like right when I raised my hand. Okay, I'm going to drain my pasta. <laughs> um, okay. I love um, the way that talking about this and I, I how it's bringing back the images really clearly to me and 
you know, I was in the film, but I wasn't in a, a lot of it. I sort of had a pretty tangential situation with that. And so I feel like that, you know, a lot of the time that I've spent with it has um, been watching it and talking about it. Um, but I, I don't know, I just, I think that the whole, how am I trying, I'm trying to pull together all these thoughts. I love what you pointed out, um, Katie, in the beginning about, about the different ways of oppression and, and the oppressor and oppress, oppressy, people who are oppressed and people who oppress, how, how, what that relationship is and how sort of integrated that is in us and generationally. Um, and I think that it, you know, it, it, it sort of reminded me also just of the web of anything. Um, so that there is this universal sense of how, how, how things are put together, how things are really, are really put together. And, and so talking, of, talking about this is bringing back these memories, these personal memories, and then ha getting woven in, having known Zap for so long, I, I too had never heard the story about the eyelashes. And I was so grateful that that was the first thing that, that came up. I mean, it's such an endearing and devastating story all at the same time, which is really how I feel about the film too. I mean, I, I do think it's really dark and hard to see, but you know, Jen was saying, well, you know me, I, I like that kind of stuff. Well, I like it too, but only when it can really hold all of it. And, and I do feel that it holds the en endearing and sweet part of, of life and um, in a good way. I think that's what makes it truly integrated. Um, and I feel that I love hearing the story about how Dee said, well, I wanna be a fairy and like, and Zach goes, well, how do we make that happen? And it just, it brought the whole, when she talked about it, it brought the whole scene back. Um, so, and I've been having a lot of, just while we're talking about cosmic things, I've been having a lot of deja vus and dream stuff lately. And I real, realized that I had a dream about this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I had it around the time that the film was being made. So um, that's sort of, it's just fun to see how when you participate in something, how it just weaves itself through your life. Um, so yeah, it just does, whether you notice it or not, I think, whether I notice it or not. And I'm really grateful for being able to notice. So thanks for having this conversation tonight. Yeah, thanks for those thoughts, Catherine. And I think right when you were, your pasta was ready, Kim was also ready <laughs> with a question. So maybe Kim, if, if it still seems like the time. Um... Well, I feel like I might be steering us a bit in a different direction, but I'm so appreciative of this time. I'm sorry you can't see me. And part of the reason why I was waiting is because there was so much stomping and yelling from my kids. <laughs> and I was hoping I'd find a quiet moment to be able to uh, add an observation or a comment. <laughs> but um, so if it continues, I apologize in advance. But um, thanks so much for having this conversation and inviting um inviting us for this time it's always i i'm so appreciative of being able to hear about other people's processes and how they come about to weaving together uh work in particular something that was so of such a, a great magnitude there's just so many different elements and um parts that I'm, I'm not as fully aware of as others that are on this meeting right now but i um, I think it's evident in, in the viewing of the work itself. And so um, something I just uh, want to honor and is, is this idea of, of being able to create space for those that you're making work with. And that's not something that always happens, particularly in film um, with hierarchies that exist within that that you've already touched upon with needing to have an order and storyboards and lists of things that need to happen and that there's no deviation, but that of course has to do with having you know, multiple 
gets people involved and trying to be aware of one another's time, but there's also something really important about the process and how you actually get to the final creation. And so weaving in the import of the process as being equal to what the final product is, is something that I think I'm hearing and really appreciating from that. Because by creating the work and bringing other people to that, you also have to bring those that are a part of the creation itself into that space. And it sounds like you're uh, you are very masterful at facilitating those kinds of experiences for other people. Uh, I also want to say that um, I am really appreciative of hearing about the parts that uh, you decided to exclude, because I've, I've listened to many artists talk about their work in, in film, and um, most recently <laughs> over the summer I heard some people talking about including a part that the dancers were not particularly comfortable with. They were being portrayed in ways that they didn't necessarily identify with and didn't feel that it was something that was aligned with them. And I realize that there is artistic license and that there is a director, but I really um, I re really appreciate you taking control of that in a way that is honoring the wishes of the people that were a part of that process, uh, which just adds to the potency and the, and the beauty of what it is that you've created. Uh, one one question I do have. Sorry, I'm just. I feel like I'm just rambling. Uh, I've been watching multiple videos all day. I'm so sorry, <laughs> really. But um, one of the things I was hoping you might speak to is the choice of place that you use. You're incorporating so many different locations and so many different dancers, which is also really gratifying to see. So many different bodies, so many different people, shapes, sizes. Uh, it, it was really beautiful to see. And so, if you could talk a little bit about how how you chose those locations and how you wove those together. I'd really appreciate hearing a bit more about that. Thank you. Yay, thanks, Kim. It's so nice to hear your voice. Um, and such insightful words. I really appreciate um, the things that you picked up on and noticed. Um, so when it comes to place, I, um, originally was gonna do most of the filming in Pittsburgh, North Carolina on some property that I'm renting a cabin. Um, the cabin is like a hundred years old and there's a lot of land around it that has kind of this encroaching pivot, uh, piv I forget what you call them, not pivot, but privet forests, like this horrible invasive, um, so it's kind of a force that I can go in and I can kind of cut and move and sculpt those bushes because they are just killing the beautiful cedar trees. And um, so I wanted to make installations there. And it's also on land where if I wanted to film, we could have just all the time in the day. You know, no one would bother us. Um, I didn't need to get some person's permission. I mean, I got Lundy's permission, it's her land, but beyond that, there's no neighbors that are super close by. And, and as I was wandering kind of around the cabin, I would just come across these structures and um, right beside the structures is just, because it's over a hundred years old that people have been, um, with that farm, of course, there are native people before then, um, but the, there's just huge piles of trash, but their trash is way cooler than our trash. So literally, I sometimes would just go out and pull bottle after bottle, hundreds of bottles. And a lot of them, well, it's like kind of three categories, mostly medicine bottles, which are super cool looking, but you're kind of like, hmm. Um, a lot of bleach bottles and a lot of alcohol and liquor bottles. And in my mind, I'm like, and here we have it, <laughs> you know, bleach, whitewashing, and then like, that's where kind of the opiate epidemic and addiction intersects with some of my concepts of all of the oppression creates trauma, creates oppression, that net that we were talking about earlier. So I knew that I wanted to utilize those bottles in some way and build these installations that movers would come inhabit. And then of course I could put them up in my little cabin and I could afford to do that because I'm always on a shoestring budget. Um, 
then I knew that I wanted to to film right around Winston-Salem because they had removed one of the Confederate sculptures earlier than a lot of other cities and I wanted to go there where there's still like a bear patch. Um, and then I really wanted a dancer to be working with us and this dancer can say who they are or not, but, um, and there was some concerns, like some injuries and also just trying to be careful um, so they invited me to film on their land. And that meant that I would be up in Charlottesville where I have this huge network of movers and performers and dancers that I wanted so badly to be in the film, but I just didn't have the means to put them up. You know, it was already hard to find food and shelter for the few people that were able to come down to the cabin. Um, so. And then because Charlottesville is one of my homes, I, I've been obsessed with those statues way before a lot of this stuff has been going down. As many people, there's been activists dealing with those statues in Charlottesville forever. And um, when I was teaching at an alternative high school, we did a lot of research and um, started some protests and did different things here and there about Sacagawea cowering before Lewis and Clark and, you know, the, the conqueror of the Northwest. I hate that one where they're about to shoot Native Americans. I know exactly what part in the Lewis and Clark journals that is. And, and of course, General Lee and the Confederate soldiers. Um, but there's then the auction block, um, like a tiny little block that you wouldn't see unless you're looking down. Um, and that was literally on the same corner as where you turned in to go into the school that I taught at for over a decade. So I thought, great, I have this opportunity to have a week of, of shooting in um, Charlottesville as well. So I can add all these other layers that I didn't think would be possible um, because of that opportunity. So you can see a pretty big difference between things that were shot in Charlottesville or on the land outside and part of Charlottesville and things shot in the forest of Cabin. Um, but that's kind of how that, that in a way they're both my homes. Um, Charlottesville will always be my home. It's in a lot of ways, my artistic home. Um, and it, and it felt really good to be able to drag that cloak of whiteness in front of all those statues I hate so much. Um, I remember being <laughs> talking to the mayor with Jen Hoyt Tidwell years ago, just trying to convince Art in Place to maybe don't take them down, but commission huge works in con like a, next to it by people of color in context like put everything in context can we um and they're like well when you get that money together come back i was like oh okay Let's see how it is um and now you know the sacagawea lewis and clark statue supposedly is going to be taken down um it sounds like a lot of activists have really have pushed forward at the uva uh end of things and so the conqueror of the Northwest is going to be removed. I wish they just put them all in a garden and have other statues there to have comment. And we, we can just talk about this in history, just take them out of the commons. Um, but anyway, that's, I kind of digress, but that was why those locations uh, were happening. And then the tobacco barn, which is on the property that I live in, um, I just had always imagined uh, Gentle Kelly being in there inside this white house from uh, another piece way back in the day. I was like, this is it. Uh, <laughs> so um, the seeds of that blossomed into something different, but um, you really get kind of the textural feeling. 
like people, tenant workers probably, maybe slaves. I, I, I still can't get the history of the tobacco barn um, from the owners and that's what that is. But um, I, I do know that it was a viable tobacco barn till about 50 years ago um, where you can hang and smoke out and dry the tobacco. So that felt pretty important in all the different interweavings of the subject matters. Did I get everything, Kim? I think that was beautiful. Yes, thank you for connect. And it connects back, I think, to something that Katie started just with, with this idea around or towards the beginning about how biography feeds into your work. And so um, thank you for that. It's wonderful to hear all of that, to see how that was able to um, come together. Thank you. Okay, I think Alan has a blue hand up. Um, so yeah, maybe I know we're moving towards seven. So um, go ahead, Alan, with your question. Maybe if it feels right, we can sort of have this be the last question. We'll see. Maybe we just wanna stay here all night and chat. Um, just a quick one. Um, first, of course, Zap, thanks uh, for um, doing this all, all month long at the, at the gallery. Um, I've uh, gotten, to, gotten to spend a lot of time in this space and witness uh, a lot of folks uh, in, engaging the video, uh, oftentimes uh, unexpectedly, um, and seen a lot, of, um, a lot of comment on social media as well, where you know, we've uh, kind of had our, our um, we've been tagged in people's uh, posts as they've walked past and happened upon it in the middle of the night or something something like that um uh, I the the question I wanted to ask is um kind of is related to to place and context I guess in a different way um it's a very different context than uh, sh sharing this in the windows of a gallery than, than I would assume um, uh, you maybe had in the forefront of your mind while you were making the piece, uh, while you were putting it together uh, uh, with, I would, say, I would say, without a doubt, the majority of folks encountering it maybe only catching a portion of it as they drive past or walk past and maybe not having the time in, in every case uh, to stop and, uh, and engage it longer and to, and to see it in its entirety. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that um, and, or any, I don't know, any, I could, I guess where it's coming from is I could see the potential for someone in your position to have some apprehension about showcasing your work in this way. And I wonder if you had any thoughts on that or whether that factored in to uh, your decision to, to go forward with this effort. Well, um, first of all, it's the bridge. So I was like, yes, there's no, no matter what, yes. I was just, yes, to the bridge. Um, but actually, the film was made to be part of a larger project, actually. I mean, it's a complicated film. Um, I can't seem to not be complicated, um, but it is created to be inside of month long residency, like an installation in a gallery or a common space that the the film itself would be broken up and you and projected in different places. And there would also be my dream is to have a place within that where someone could, it would be on a loop and you just wanted to see the film for itself, you could. Um, and that inside that installation, um, there would also be live performance elements. Like I would bring back all the dancers who were in the film um, at different, points if they could be part of it that there would be um, community talkbacks and a giant a friend a type thing like the apothecaries would show up about um, you could put loved ones uh, pictures or um, 
words for them if they were caught up in the opiate epidemic wherever in the spectrum they were uh that we could have a stick hut inside and um that one was more sticky for me to try to understand that the boys and girls club could be part of it and be invited into spaces they normally aren't part of um uh you know all then there would be tea like actual live tea japanese tray tea um once a week uh so just kind of like a artistic residency with uh, a lot of you know social justice aspects um blended in community aspects so so when I made it, I, I don't, I, I'm not that kind of a, a creator where I see the whole vision, I get visions and I, I aim for them, but then D wants to be a theory, you know? So things uh, ebb and, and change direction. Um, it says structured improv, but that is my dream. I do want that to, to happen at some point. Um, but I also like elements to live strongly on their own as well so i wanted it to be a standalone film that could be watched and no one had to ever know that i had this bigger dream for it um i thought i wanted to make each chapter standalone but they don't so that was a, a original concept and that didn't happen so when you and katie came to me and and um presented this opportunity it just made me so happy. And when I went and watched it, it's just so cool and vibrant, like the location and inhabiting an interesting space. And as a site specific um, artist, it, it just thrilled me. I mean, I would uh, love for um, more things like that to happen uh, with the film or any other film, you know, I think, uh, Shandela Goldman is, um, she is doing a film that's gonna be projected on the Woolen Mills Church for Let There Be Light. And that just like thrills me um, that's coming up soon. And um, why not, you know, in the past, uh, Johnny St. Hours used to have screenings from the rooftop in the downtown mall, just in the middle of the night. And um, especially in urban settings, why not utilize this space and then with the pandemic, um, where probably my my dream of installation residency is uh, not quite possible in the way that I foresaw it, um, being outside and being able to get some pizza and watch that film was just such a pleasure so, and such a pleasure. And I just saw um, another amazing musician, Charlottesville musician, uh, Kathy Monet's had has like riffed on it because she lives in these neighborhoods and she happened upon it. She didn't even know what was happening. She was so excited. And um, so thank you for the opportunity. It, I think that the building itself served it well. Um, the location next to Old Spud Nuts and made me really happy. I'm just, I, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, 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 no. I was just gonna say well, while you were responding, Zap, and and talking about, and I think this is a little bit embedded in Alan's question. But earlier today, I I texted Zap and and asked her if there was anything she wanted me to include, and um, she said I trust you, and I think that's just really telling of Zap's work and her relation to her audience is that she has trust, like. There's this trust that even if you see part of it, you're going to handle it with care, or that it's going to resonate, and and the that willingness to to trust an audience and to to hand over something, I think, is a large part of all of your work. And so I'm going to keep that little message. It just says, "I trust you." Period. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that just came to mind when I was thinking about your willingness to, yeah, share this, this long film um, outdoors publicly um, and the generosity of that. So thank you. Um, and perhaps, you know, that's a good note to end on. Um, 
it's 707 and it's been there with oh hi um that's what i love about zoom is like we have no idea there could be like 40 people watching from the side you know it's also secretive and like like a stage um so i will let you all go and continue with your evenings but it was so nice to spend this time with you and um yeah stay in touch elizabeth good to see you oh Elizabeth, so great to see you. So great to see all of y'all and Katie. Thank you so much and Alan and all the performers who are here. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I think you all have links to the film, but it's also at the Bridge PIA website. Um, and you can go check out some of the upcoming shows that we'll have um, out on the, in the windows rather. I think maybe Elizabeth is. Can can you hear me? I'm having technical issues, but I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> we'll talk. I love that, Elizabeth. That was so avant garde of you. Sounded amazing. Um, uh, have a great evening, you all, and thanks for thanks for joining.